All right, guys, so you, by now you've built a few rods, you've sold a few rods, you're excited, you're ready to take the rod build business to the next level. But you have some questions, some doubts, maybe this isn't the right thing, what should I be thinking about, what do I need to do? I got you covered today. Today I want to give you some tips and give you some advice on things that I think you should consider before you take the deep dive and go into rod building. Um, my name is Sam Robles. Uh, I'm the owner of Apollo Fishing. I started building rods um, on my own as a hobby, probably maybe like 15, 10 to 15 years ago. I know it's a big span in there, but somewhere in between there. And I did it primarily for the same reason a lot of y'all do. You just like, you, you couldn't, you wanted something different out there, whether it's a color wraps or specific blanks or whatever it may have been. You, want, you just wanted something that was different. Or maybe you thought you could build a high-end rod for a little bit lower than what you would pay for it all, all on the shelf. So whatever your reason was, you you, you wanted to build your own rods. Uh, you, you probably bought a kit the way I did, maybe even the same kit from Mudhole uh, that came with all the power or a yeah, hand wrapper at the time and uh, your blank and whatever components you needed. And, uh, and maybe some of you guys still have your first rod. I still have my first rod. Um, which is actually now that I look at it back, look at back at it, it's a, it's a pretty crappy build. The rod is great, but you know, the blank was great, but the quality maybe wasn't what it is today, man. But nonetheless, you started off by doing that, and uh, and and you know, you sold some a few rods to your friends and family, the guys that are going to help you out no matter what. And then little by little, you started taking on maybe more customers and. You know, whether your friend's friend or maybe a second cousin reached out to you, hey, can you build me some rods? And you started, you know, seeing some real traction around there on your rod building business. And it came across your mind and saying, hey, um, I think I want to build more rods and sell more rods. And uh, and, and maybe that's where you're at right now. But and, and I think right now is when kind of where I want to share my experience in terms of how I made that pivot. And went from kind of building onesie twosie rods a month to building a lot more than that now so anyway so let's jump right into it and let me share my tips with you again these are my personal experiences there's no right or wrong some of these may seem kind of obvious actually a lot of these seem quite obvious to me now um they didn't seem quite obvious to me at the time when i was starting so i'm trying to talk to myself if you will if i was you know maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago um, in the past. And uh, I'm going to share some tips with you. But I'm also going to be continuing to drink my beer as I talk to this because I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying myself right now. And I think, I think actually this is, this is probably one of the most important things, uh, maybe not important, but one of the things I like about rod building the most is that you can kind of get in your zone, whatever your zone means, right? you got your music going on, grab a beer or a drink or whatever it is and just kind of chill and relax. So... Um, the first thing that you need to consider before you going, before you jump into rod building, um, or taking your rod building to the next level is, and I think a lot of people struggle with this. That's why I'll start there. But I think you, you have to adequately define your goals. And I, it sounds pretty simple. Um, you know, you got to know where you're going before you can get where you're going. I get that. But I think a lot of people struggle with knowing what they want to get out of rod building. You know, you, you may have this thought that there is a demand for your product, and, and likely there is if you're at this point, but you don't really know what you want to get out of it. Um, you, you, you're trying to ask yourself is, you know, things that are going through your mind at this point is, you know, do, do, I, do I want to go from making maybe three, four, or whatever the number is, rods a week or a month to 10, 12? Maybe, I don't know. Um, do you want to generate another five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month by selling rods? Maybe. Um, but but you really have to look at these goals and understand what exactly you're trying to accomplish. And I think a lot of people I think it's a good starting point because again, if you just try to go out there and sell more rods, yeah, you might be able to sell more rods. But now you're you're spending your, your weekends, and I'm assuming a lot of you guys are doing this on your free time the way I was and still am, but um, you you spend up your weekends building rods and you're like, crap, I got a customer that wants his rod next week and I've got three customers that want their rods at this time. And I'm like, man, I got to 
I can't go fishing anymore or I can't go to my daughter's ball game or whatever it is for y'all because I'm at home building rods. And, and I think that's an important part you have to differentiate or you have to think about when you're, when you're thinking about scaling your business. I think we all get really excited about the idea of, of selling more rods, making more money by selling more rods. Um, but there's always a trade-off out there. And understanding what you're really trying to trade off in order to sell more rods, I think that's important. And so, so I would recommend before you jump into whatever the next scale is, is you take a step back and objectively define what you want, to, what growth and what success means to you. And, and I would, I would, I'd actually kind of get very granular in this point and say, um, you know, put a time component to it, right? Some of you guys may know about smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timing, or, or whatever it is. But it's, it, essentially, it's like it's very objective and it becomes very clear whether or not you achieve your goal. And uh, I would start with a smart goal. Um, and if you're mid currently selling four rods a month and if you want to grow and you're willing to commit to the time and effort to go from four to six, then be very clear. I want to sell six months six rods over a month or maybe it's I want to generate an additional six hundred dollars a month so anyways kind of rambled on a little bit there but very clearly your first my first tip is to adequately define your goals before you take it to the next level so step one so my second tip is if you're currently not go ahead and get incorporated um, and begin taking advantage of wholesale pricing there's a difference between retail pricing, which if you go to Mudhole or Get Bit and the pricing you'll see there versus wholesale pricing. And that difference in price, depending on the specific product, can be anywhere between 20% and 30% or 40% um, accordingly. So, and, it's, and sometimes when you set up your wholesale accounts, you might be able to buy directly from their suppliers. So um, you may be able to buy directly from Batson per se, right? And, and granted, I know there's some minimum quantities out there, but you, you'll never be able to achieve any of those if you're not incorporated. So my first tip is get incorporated and take advantage of your wholesale, um, wholesale pricing. There's different ways to get incorporated. Um, I'm not a tax advisor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a CPA. Um, if you do have someone like that you want to talk to, great, talk to them. Uh, but essentially... Um, the most common, what I've seen, is getting incorporated as an LLC. And even at that, you can kind of go down S Corp or not, or, or pass through, or whatever it may be. Um, if, if, if that really matters to you, or you have a very unique situation, then definitely talk to an accountant. And otherwise, just, I would, I would say probably an LLC probably works for most people. But again, talk to whoever you need to talk to and make that decision. Um, in terms of actually filing and getting incorporated and starting an LLC, it's really going to depend on your specific state. They'll have different requirements, uh, different fees associated. Uh, I think in Texas, it's roughly about three to four hundred dollars with the registration fees or, or, or what they'll cost you to get set up. Um, and then you know, there's also like subsequent type fees that you have to or forms you have to file out specifically. Uh, You'll also have to file uh, with, the, with the IRS to get an EIN number. Um, do that. Um, again, it's kind of, you have to do the Texas one first or get incorporated first and then go request an EIN after, after you're, you've incorporated. But the whole process can take a few weeks and it's going to cost you several hundred dollars if you kind of handle it yourself. You can hire someone, you can, you can hire a firm to help you out. Um, I know some people use LegalZoom and they kind of walk you through the entire process. You do pay a premium or additional fee on top of that. Um, but at least in Texas, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy for anyone to do it. And then the IRS doesn't charge you anything. So um, again, three three to four hundred dollars if you do it yourself, maybe another two hundred dollars if you have someone help you. And obviously if you're if if you're in a different state uh, where the fees are higher, then you know those those numbers would be higher. But definitely set up Get incorporated and start taking advantage of your wholesale accounts because I'll tell you what, we're doing wholesale and uh, your customer is not going to be very happy if you sell them a rod and I sell them the very same exact rod, same blade, same wrap, same components for, you know, 
20% off, right? Or 20% difference in price. So, um, and if you're, you're paying retail prices for everything, including your tools and consumables, like you're leaving money on the table if you are able to sell those rods. Um, and uh, second of all, you're going to have a hard time because you're competing with people that are doing this already. Caveat to this is that there are additional fees and reporting things that you'll have to do after you're incorporated. You'll have to file with the state quarterly or monthly like we do, um, but um, you can manage that and, and, and work through it. It is worth the pain of submitting these sales tax reports in order to get your um, the, the, the price break to you for wholesale retail accounts. All right, so number two, again, recap. Get your wholesale, get incorporated, and get your wholesale account. Number three is where the third tip is. It's really something I look back on. It's something I wish somebody would slap me in the face and tell me, "Do this before you do that," or "Do make sure you do this." And that is um, focus on growing in your geographic area before you try to grow outside of it. I think we, we all get really excited and we think there's big markets in other areas. Um, and the idea of being able to sell more rods and kind of grow your brand or your business outside of where you're currently at is, is exciting, right? I get it. Like, I went through it. And and I, you know, where we're at, we're in South Texas. And so it's, it's, it's a pretty small area. And the idea of selling rods, we're kind of building a name for ourselves in Houston, which is about 300 miles from here, 375 miles from here. It was really exciting to me when I first started. I was like, man, like I need to spend more time and spend more money in Houston. And so I did. And um, and looking back at it at that point in time, sure, there might be a few customers that I've been able to retain over the past years, but that physical distance makes it so hard to fulfill to adequately fulfill your customers' requirements, specifically in the custom rod game. Or business, then, uh, then, then, then you'd be able to do if you were in if the customer was right next door to you or in your area. One thing you'll learn about this rod business, whether and some of you may know it already, but is that custom rods is there's a lot of trust that's associated with you, right? Like someone's empowering you or trusting you with a build and. and you know, sub subsequently, a few hundred dollars to to build them a raw that's going to meet their needs or their requirements out there. And I can do another video about why someone would consider buying a custom rod, but nonetheless, there's various reasons why someone wants it, and, and they're trusting you. And it's hard to establish that trust with someone when they're physically away from you, right? You look at like trying to do like pen pals or like online dating from like someone out there. Like it's hard, right? Like you have to physically meet someone, spend time with them, get to know them. And, uh, and it's a lot easier to do that when, when it's, when you physically can interact with this person. So, uh, versus kind of just going via email, maybe some phone calls and, and, and um, or text messages, whatever. Okay. Step number four, and a lot of people may not like this, but it's really getting into the numbers of your business. Um, so knowing all the costs associated with your business, whether they're direct or indirect costs, um, it's important that you know your numbers. And so when I know your numbers, I, th I think the easiest number for people to know is revenue, right? How much cash did I bring in from selling my products or providing my services? That's the easiest the second easiest are your direct costs, right? So if someone comes in asking me for a rod, I know how much I paid for the blank, I know how much I paid for the guides, the grip, the seat, blah, 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 right? It becomes very clear. It's the indirect costs that begin to um, impact you. The indirect costs are the things that you pay for that maybe are sp spread across multiple builds. Things like internet, electricity, um, your website if you're running it, ads if you're running ads on Facebook or Instagram, um, your consumables, your glue, right? Even though that's kind of direct in nature, but it's indirect in the sense that you buy a, you know, a tub of glue and, or, or epoxy and you apply it um, across multiple rods. So 
But being able to estimate all those indirect costs and being able to normalize them and say, for every rod that I build, these are, you know, I'm spending $15 of indirect cost associated with it and add that to your, your number. So you have your direct cost. And again, there's two components to the direct cost, but I'll come back to the second part. The direct cost is the physical materials. The indirect costs are kind of the consumables that are spread across multiple builds and then all the other overhead type costs. And then you have labor. Labor is where a lot of people get hooked, trick, um, caught up on. And I think labor is a really interesting cost that people incorporate in a lot of different ways. I think at its simplest form, labor, people, rod builders specifically, want to earn a certain hourly rate, right? So if I spend four hours building your rod in labor, I'm going to charge you this much in labor. And, and that's good, right? So you take your, your fixed cost your direct cost, your indirect cost, and then your labor cost as part of your direct cost, and you come up with a number. Um, the only problem with that is, and it's, it's really not a problem, it just really kind of goes back to the first goal in terms of what your goals are. But if your cost structure only incorporates all the direct and partially indirect costs, and that's what you're selling your rod for, right? So um, you, you take the material cost, you add your indirect cost, and then you add your labor, and when that's all said and done, let's say it's $300, and you charge $300 for it. Um, you're gonna struggle a little bit, quite honestly. Um, essentially, there's two main areas where people struggle with this, but I think you're gonna struggle in, not in the sense of being able to provide rods, so you can continue doing rods for every rod you build, you're gonna get paid this hourly rate uh, for the labor associated with the rod, but um, I do think that, that if you're trying to establish a rod business, that there's, there's probably two other key costs that, or things that need to be incorporated in your cost structure. The first one is, is warranty. Um, you know, people are gonna break rods. I've seen it happen here, like literally someone will grab a rod and they'll take it out and they'll, they'll come back in and, 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 you know, a foot of that rod is broken and they'll say, I slammed the door on my rod, right? And it's very clear to me, right? They, they literally walked out and they came in a few minutes later. I'm not gonna believe them that they said, you know, I had a, a 30 inch redfish and he broke my fish and, and, you know, he literally just walked out the door. But I do get occasionally that person that says I broke, you know, I, I was fighting a 30 inch redfish and um, he broke the rod when I was fighting him and, and that may be true. Um, at the end of the day, um, and even if that's quantitatively a fact, um, you have a rod that's broken that can't be fished anymore. And, and, and you've got to make a decision on how you're going to handle that. And I'm not telling folks how to do it. I'll tell you, give you a little bit of advice how I do it. Um, I do consider um, warranty into my cost structure. And this goes back into knowing your numbers, right? So for every rod that I sell, there's there's two other costs associated with it. Um, in addition to all the costs I talked about it. One is a warranty, a percentage of that rod, uh, of that rod sale, of the revenue that's generated from that is going into essentially a warranty fund or an insurance fund, however you wanna look at it, right? So this is a bucket of money that we're actively and explicitly calling out from this sale um, to, to be able to help Joey when he breaks his rod, right? Um, whether it's right or wrong, at the end of the day, Joey has a broken rod, he can't fish it, he can't use it anymore, and I gotta, I gotta figure out whether or not I wanna hold, I wanna help Joey get into another rod. And um, at this point, if I have a little bit of a fund, I know that I can take a loss on this specific transaction to keep Joey as a customer. And not all customers are worth keeping, but nonetheless, you know, it's not that big of a hit, or it, it helps burden, it helps manage and facilitate that hit if you have, if you know you have a little bit of wiggle room on the backside of it so that you can take a loss on today's sale 
with the idea that, hey, Joey's a great customer. He's going to come back in the future and buy more rods from me. Or he's going to buy whatever else from me. And um, over a period of time, the, the, the loss that I took on this individual transaction is going to come back and, and pay dividends in the future. So, so anyway, so I, I rambled on a lot about, about that. But nonetheless, the, the, the third tip is, was that the third tip or was that my fourth tip? That was my fourth tip, okay. My fourth tip is to know your numbers, know, know the very specifics and the details of all the costs that go into your business and, uh, and be able to understand them. And, and just, don't, just don't consider warranty, or sorry, just don't consider the direct costs, the labor costs, and your indirect costs. Be sure to account for other things as labor. Oh, there is one other part of, of, of cost that I do think is important, and, and, and it's, it's profitability and uh or margin right so in addition to all these costs i like to add a little bit on top of that uh, to be able to facilitate the growth of the business right so and the idea is that if i disconnected or i pulled myself completely away from the operation i.e i hire a rod builder that can i'd pay that same rate to put out a rod you know it, it you know this and and you know I have a little bit left in there that goes back into the business. So that allows me to take, you know, let's say I have a $300 rod, right? And I pay a rod builder $100 to build a rod or, or whatever it is, right? Um, I, there's probably about $15 or $20 on that backside of it that I'm going to say, hey, after I paid all my costs, including labor, including warranty, there's $15 to $20 that are left over. Right, and, and that's a margin of let's say eight percent, whatever it is. Or sorry, a three hundred dollar rod. Um, maybe, anyways, I can't do math right now. But if there's a margin, there's a few dollars left over. Um, and and you know, and that that money kind of goes similar to the warranty fund. It goes into like the growth fund, right? So now I can continue to do this. Now, like what I made from one rod, I can now make one point two rods, right? Whatever. And you kind of keep on building this fund to be able to do that. And, and, and I think that's really important if your end goal is to be able to sell rods at scale um, because now you're no longer directly coupled to the labor, to the man hours. If you're not selling rods, you have a mechanism and there's enough um, profitability or margin in your pricing that allows you to essentially hire someone to do rods and you can continue to grow right and as your brand uh, your, your brand continues to grow there'll be enough equity and whether you want to take that you know 20 or 15 or 20 dollars per rod and kind of say hey this is my royalty um you can do that or you can continue to uh, reinvest it and double down and continue to grow your rod business with that extra money all right so number number four again was uh, knowing your numbers, and there's a lot of different things around knowing your numbers, but understanding all the costs that are associated with uh, your business, and, under, and being able to leave some wiggle room in there for warranties and for growth. Right. The fifth one is my fifth tip here is to. Um, understand and identify opportunities that differentiate you from any other rod builder out there. And, and this is tough. This is really tough out there because there's a lot of really good rod builders out there. Um, and so, so the question is like, again, I talked about it earlier a little bit, like it's all about trust. You know, why would someone trust you to build their rods? Um, I've seen a lot of builders early on focus on trying to differentiate themselves around the components they use um, and say, well, you know, these, this rod is built off of better components. And, and, and that may be true, right? I'm not saying it's not true, but at that point, the reality is that I or myself and, and any other rod builder have access to the same components that anybody else does, right? Um, no one's in their backyard. Maybe a few people are, but for the majority is... For the majority, no one's in their in their garage building blanks and building guides or whatever it may be. We're all ordering from the same suppliers, and we all have access to the same suppliers. So, uh, the idea that you're building from better components may have some pull in certain scenarios, specifically in scenarios where you're comparing your components versus 
um, the components I'll say like a rod that's at Walmart or whatever your, your, your store is. But, um, but, but other than that, like when you're comparing yourself against another rod builder, it, it's really tough, right? Especially if you have really good rod builders like we do down here. There's a lot of people that build really great rods. Um, so when you can't differentiate yourself against your rod builder on, on in some cases, quality, um, or even the quality of your components or qual quality of labor, um, some people tend to kind of go on the, the area of, Try to compete on price, and competing on price is a is a very difficult thing. I, I always tell people don't to compete on price unless you absolutely have to, and then as soon as you and get away from it as soon as you can. The the, the situation about competing with price is that you're only your customers are only as loyal to you as long as your your customers are loyal to you as long as your pricing is the lowest. Out there and as soon as you try to increase pricing um, your customers are going to go to um, the lowest price person right and, and and again that's assuming that your customers are very price sensitive out there and typically in rod building that may not be the case but I, I get it for someone that's building their first rod maybe they don't want to spend three four hundred dollars maybe they're more comfortable spending spending two hundred dollars and they're going to try you out to kind of get be that first experience and depending on how that goes they may or may not buy um, a custom rod again in the future or they may not buy from uh, any custom rod builder in the future so um, be very careful when competing on price um, I've had to compete on price I mean, uh, and early on in my um, in my rod building journey and when I did um, I always made it very clear that I was offering my customer a discount um, so it's not hey this is my price I'm the lowest price that guy out there so that wasn't the case it was always around I'm selling you this rod. This is the regular price, and I'm going to give you a discount in exchange for helping me promote my business. And I want, I'm going to ask you to tell your friends and all your buddies that you know that I'm I build custom rods, and and, and with the intention that maybe those guys come to you. And, and I think that's important because it sets the expectation that hey, I know that Sam charges three hundred fifty dollars for a rod. Or whatever you charge for it and he's selling it to me for maybe half of that because he's expecting for me to promote him and help him out on the backside and that's very different than some me selling a rod for say 175 dollars and someone everybody expecting well that's just the price that's what sam charges out there right and, and i think it's very it's very different and for that reason i would always say you're priced up here whatever your pricing is and just make it very clear to your customer that you're offering a discount in exchange for um the ability or to do to, to get your brand out there or uh, more more specifically having your customer help promote your brand um so again if you can't compete on quality which again is hard you can't compete on price or i tell you not to compete on price because it's not sustainable um I think the biggest area a lot of rod builders, specifically new rod builders, can um, hone in on is differentiating on the experience, right? And the experience can mean a lot of different things, but kind of the way I hone in on a few things in here. The easier you, the, the better experience you give someone who's trying to build a custom rod, the more likely they're going to come to you, right? And experience, they can have a good experience in a lot of different ways. One, um, is, you know, even when it comes out to specking out a rod, I've heard of some rod builders saying, oh, here's a catalog. You guys have all seen the mud, mud hole catalogs. They're like this thick. Here's a catalog. Let me know what blank you want, what grip you want, blah, 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 right? And I'll build you the rod. That's not. If you're doing that, maybe take a step back and reconsider doing that. I don't think that's the most effective way of doing it. Um... And what I would do instead was have a conversation uh, with your customer or potential customer and ask them what type of fishing they're looking for, what their preference for techniques are, and then kind of use your knowledge and experience on components and, and make recommendations accordingly. Um, but even at that, it can be very overwhelming, right? There's thousands of blanks we can choose from, thousands of guides and, and so forth. So um, what I like to do is I like to have good, better, best, right? Uh, so you're targeting redfish, okay? 
you're looking for throwing salt plastics, you know, with a 16th ounce jig it. Ah, okay. You're looking to wade fish. Oh, okay. So now I know I, I put you into, I've used my experience with building rods and fishing to kind of put, to kind of understand what your needs are. And now I have from there, I have three different tiers. I have good, better, best. I mean, we've all gone to Home Depot and bought their paintbrushes and say good, better, best, right? Very similar. Um, the good is going to be economically, you know, the, you know, the best value type rod out there. So I'm going to give you a rod that meets your needs. It may not be the best blank. It may not be the best, and they may not be titanium guides, but they're going to meet your need. Uh, this is a, as a package. Um, better is maybe I upgrade your blank and everything else is the same. And then best is upgraded blank with upgraded components and so forth. All the bells and whistles. Um, that makes it very easy for a customer to say, I want the very best that you have for doing this specific application. And that's great, right? Like that, that's where you want to be. You made it very easy for your customer at that point. Actually, like if you get to that point, you, you're kind of like, the next thing is like, well, what color thread do you want, right? And, and that's okay too, right? But that, that makes it like, the, objectively, the, the customer is going to get a rod what they really like. Uh, that meets their needs and then you talk about personalizing that rod in a very specific manner based on threads or whatever it may be but um, I think that's one area where customers can or where rod builders can really differentiate themselves just make it make it make it easy for your customers to be able to order rods um, the next one is I think is pretty straightforward but I've had plenty of people walk through that door there and uh, and tell us otherwise um, is be very transparent with your customers after they place their order, right? So you did a good job in explaining, you know, the different rods and good, better, best, and you got an order. Um, and now you're, it's taking a while for the customer to get their rod. Um, sometimes I know like, like, like when I first started, I, I, I didn't have enough cash on hand to maintain any blanks on inventory, any components on inventory. So I wouldn't order anything for a rod until I actually received an order, right? And even at that, like I would, it would take me a little bit because whether the customer gave me a deposit or whether I had other things I was waiting on, whatever it may be, like it wasn't immediately out there. Uh, customers are anticipating, expecting that rod based on what you tell them early on. But I think it's fair to say, you know, three, four weeks, is fairly average for a custom rod build, a simple custom rod build. Um, so, so if, it, if it's taking you, you know, a week from the time that order is placed to order components and blanks, and then some of those things are back ordered, you're you're looking at not getting everything for you know three or four weeks in your hands, or right before you can actually start building that rod. And if you have a queue of rods, or if you're working, or if you're doing all these other things, that time just compounds and. Uh, and it could very really easily, you start going into the months without the customer getting their rod back. Um, and I've seen a lot of people uh, complain about rod builders not taking excessive times for um, durations and how long it takes to get custom, to get their rods back. And I placed an order with them and I never heard from them. They went away and, you know, they won't answer my calls anymore. Um, and, and again, like for me, like, like, like that's just... You're setting yourself up for failure when you start doing that. Like, like you, you found someone, you've convinced, you found someone that trusts you um, to spend several hundred dollars on building a rod from you, and now you're just kind of letting that go by not being honest. A lot of pre people appreciate the honesty and the transparency, um, and and whatever you can do to make that very clear um, in terms of like, look, look, I've ordered this two days after we talked and look, here it is, right? Like I'm waiting on this rod. It's just hadn't showed up. It's on back order, whatever it may be. Um, but I, I think being able to, 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 to help the customer and be very transparent with them and not intentionally deceive them um, around that is, is, um, is a very important tactic um, for, uh, for establishing trust and being able to differentiate yourself. Again, it sounds very simple, but um, I've, I've, I personally see a lot of people that customers that come in here that are dissatisfied and have a bad taste with other rod builders because they weren't doing such. Um, the third, the third idea for being able to differentiate yourself is, um, and it, it actually addresses both of those previous needs or the first two ideas that I suggested here earlier, but is is really kind of double down on your niche. 
and choose a niche. I guess a niche means like a very specific application, right? Like the market's this big, and I'm going to hone in on like this very small group here. And so to hone in on that, right? So if you're selling um, rods to the people that fish saltwater, right? Redfish, trout, flounder, or whatever it is you're doing, maybe you can get a little bit more specific, right? Like, and and the, the, the more specific you can get, the, you know, the finer your niche is. And granted, you're, you're going from this to this, but you can be known for this and being the best, best person that does this, right? And so, so an, an application of that would be like, hey, I'm going to build a rod that's made for w winter fishermen that like to throw corkies trying to catch big oversized trout, right? And, uh, and that can be pretty specific um, in there, right? So now you're talking about, okay, I know what, length of rod I'm talking about. I know what power of rod I'm talking about. I know what action of rod I'm talking about. And everybody, if I focus in on this, everybody that likes to do this type of fishing is going to come to me because I've established myself, potentially established myself as a, the the person that focuses in on this very specific case. So you become kind of like the, the subject matter expert. Maybe not. But if you, if you partner up with someone that can give you some advice and if you like to fish that technique also, then it kind of gives you that credibility. But now not you're just focusing on a niche. Um, and what that also allows you to do is like, well, in, in this niche, 90% of my customers use this one blank, right? So now you can have an inventory of those blanks in stock, right? And, and all those components associated with it. And, and you don't have to have such a wide range of variability in your blanks and your components, whatever. You might have to increase your cost of inventory on hand, but you know that people are going to come to you looking for a spe very specific blank and you got them. So instead of carrying, you know, 60, 70 different blanks, you carry three. And instead of carrying 30, 40 different guides or sets of guides, you have three. And when a customer come, when a customer comes to you, it's really more just choosing what color thread you have because you know what blanks you're going to get, you know what components you're going to get, and it's just I want red threads or I want blue threads or I want this to register or whatever it may be. And uh, and so you really begin to differentiate yourself for that very specific application. But then you can like the other areas it benefits from it. Right now you can turn rods around instead of having a six week lead time. You can turn those rods around in two, three weeks because you have all the inventory on hand and you can work it accordingly. So, okay, these are just some ideas, but I think really honing in on the experience that you give your customer um, and the easier you make it for your customer and the better experience you give for your customer, that's what's going to pay the most dividends. So that was tip number five is really just, again, identifying ways to differentiate yourself from your competitors, hone in on a niche and set yourself up to um, deliver to that specific niche. All right, so I did have another tip here, but I didn't finish capturing notes on here. Um, I'll talk about it briefly here, and it's not really a tip, it's just a tip, more of a consideration. Um, so a lot of people hone in on, on, like they talk about custom rods and why custom rods are better than an off the shelf rod, right? And, and it's like, I I manage every component or every quality aspect of this, the build of this rod, from the selection of the components to the placement of the guides to just the wrapping of the threads, all of it, right? Like I'm in full control of this and I'm gonna do my darn best to make sure that this rod is built to the highest quality, right? And, and it's easier to do that when you're building a smaller quantity of rods, right? So you have more time to build these rods. This whole video is about growing, right? So it's like, well, now you have the same amount of time. We all, you know, only have 24 hours a day. We all do whatever it may be um, in, in those 24 hours. But now you talk about, you know, it was taking me, you know, during a 24 hour period or 48 hours or whatever it is, I was putting out one or two rods. Now you're trying to grow that from one to two rods to say three to four rods. And that's automatically half the time, right? So, so how do you maintain quality, uh, during growth is something that a lot of rod builders are struggle with, right? It's, 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 it's easy to maintain that quality when you're putting out one rod or whatever it is every few days versus, having to put out, you know, five or six rods because it's December 20th and you got to get all these rods put out, six, seven rods, whatever it may be before Christmas. So 
um, being able to manage that. And that goes back into understanding what your goals and what you're trying to get to. But it's something that I, I think is very important to, uh, to, to growing to the next level. If you're at this point, you've, you've had some success. You're excited about it. You're ready to take your business to the next level. You may have some hesitation. Um, my advice would be get your facts together. Follow these tips I had. There's more things out there that I would consider for sure, but these are the big ones out there. The rest of them are smaller things like how do you market on Facebook? How do you market on Instagram? Do you get pro staff, right? Whatever. Don't worry about those. If you can't do these first five things right, none of these other things will matter. Um, but focus on these five things on getting them right early on before you take that step into the next area. And I think you'll be successful. So um, this whole channel, I mean, you, there's a lot of different videos and, and we haven't made a lot of videos over the last um, maybe year or so. We've been busy with work and with our shop. But um, this, whole, this whole channel is around helping people become either better fishermen or better rod builders. And, uh, and I'm really kind of opening myself up here to answer any questions uh, and provide any advice and help any people in, in whatever way I can. Um, a few, maybe about a year and a half ago, I made this video about decals and how to print decals with uh, Larry's printer. And uh, I've actually, I've met a lot of cool people through this process. A lot of people, I get a lot of phone calls. It's almost like three or four phone calls a week about people asking me about this specific part about like rod building, right? Decals, right? Uh, but those those conversations kind of manifest into something else, right? We talk about, well, what about this and what about that? And then you just kind of open themselves up. And uh, I don't know, like for me, I just, I've really appreciated, appreciated all the people and all the help I've gotten in the rod building business. And this is kind of our attempt to be able to provide some information back. So um, anyways, I think I've rambled off enough and, uh, where I was going with that, it was I'm just kind of opening my opening myself up, to open invitation. Anyone has any questions or needs any advice, whether it's a specific rod building tip, and by, by, by no means am I anywhere near the best rod builder. I'm not uh, actually I'm not even the best rod builder within Paula Rods. My uncle is right. So, um, but if, in any ways, if anyone has any questions around how things are done or things to consider. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Our email address is on our website. Um, but anyways, that's the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Maybe you got something out of it. Maybe not. Maybe you at least maybe had a few beers with me over you rambling on. And um, yeah, let me know in the comments below if you guys are interested in hearing any other topics. Uh, I will cover all the various, not all the various, the topics I want to talk about as part of this whole series of growing your rod building business. But um all right, guys. We'll catch you on the next video. Tight lines.